The Rings of Power has proved itself to be a lightning rod in popular culture, with it eliciting some of the most extreme reactions I have seen surrounding a show in a long time. If you were to listen to the discourse around the show, many people would have you believe that Rings of Power is the worst thing ever created, that it murdered your childhood, desecrated Tolkien's grave, burned his lifelong works to ash, and is nothing more than a cover for Amazon to force their political ideologies on the unsuspecting masses. The reality is far less exciting, as the Rings of Power isn't interesting enough to be the demon spawn many claim it to be. The reason that what would normally just be a boring, mediocre fantasy show has generated such vitriol is because it takes place in Tolkien's world, a world that is very dear to a lot of people. Tolkien's stories were so foundational that they were the progenitor of what we now know as modern fantasy. His works are so elaborate and expansive that it has led to the rise of Tolkien scholars, who dedicate their lives to studying and understanding his world and its histories. Rings of Power also exists in a world with the Peter Jackson trilogy, heralded by all as an incredible set of movies that do justice to Tolkien's world. Middle Earth and its stories have played an important role in the lives of many people, and there was never a question that every frame of Rings of Power would be under the microscope to see if it lived up to the material that it was adapting. Combine the vigor of the fan base with the astronomical amount of money that Amazon spent on the show, expectations were sky high, and Rings of Power was destined to fall short. I think these are some of the primary reasons why the show is looked on by so many with such hate and disgust, and effectively makes it seem worse than it actually is. Amazon likely didn't help the show's reputation when they temporarily suspended reviews for the show in an attempt to limit review bombing. This fed into the mob's anger and made them feel like they were being silenced for telling the truth. Now this is not to say that Rings of Power is a good show, or that much of the criticism isn't justified. It is. Rings of Power is incredibly flawed, but it is not without its merits. Rings of Power's greatest crime is that it is boring, and whenever a new episode dropped, I was never in much of a hurry to watch it, because I was largely uninvested in the characters and the stories being told. This is likely another reason for the outrage surrounding the show, as many people are angry with what the Rings of Power could have been, as opposed to what we ended up getting. Before getting into the meat of this review, I feel compelled to disclose my experience with Tolkien's world prior to the Rings of Power. Like many others, The Lord of the Rings is something that is incredibly dear to me and was foundational in shaping my love of storytelling. When I was a child, my grandfather gave my brothers and I his copies of the Lord of the Rings books just after the first Peter Jackson movie was released. I've read the main Lord of the Rings books multiple times and can practically quote the Jackson trilogy from memory with the amount of times that I've watched them. They're taking the hobbits to Isengard! Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys! I've read the Hobbit multiple times and have seen the movies as bad as they are. I've read some of Tolkien's extended works like Children of Huron and The Silmarillion, although it has been years since I've read them and my recall the Silmarillion isn't great, as I remember being a challenging read for me at the time. Also, growing up in the early 2000s, I engaged with any and all Lord of the Rings media, as I had Lord of the Rings action figures, played Lord of the Rings Risk, and played a bunch of Lord of the Rings video games. Lord of the Rings has been part of my life for 20 years, and also serves as a connection to my grandfather. And as important as the Lord of the Rings has been to my life, it has no doubt played an even larger role in the lives of countless others. I mention this so that you know what kind of perspective I have coming into the Rings of Power, as well as to further illustrate how much these stories mean to people, and and the monumental task the Rings of Power was trying to undertake. With all that said, I have a lot to say about Season 1 of the Rings of Power, and in this video I will be taking an in-depth look at everything that happened throughout the season. I will be looking at the season in detail, so I will be going into full spoilers. And to just go, trust me, we've shown it the respect and given it the amount of dedication and love that it deserves, you're going to be very happy. This is where the show dies for a lot of people. As I've previously stated, this material is incredibly important to so many people that any change made to the work feels like sacrilege. Some fans have dedicated their lives to studying the lore of Tolkien's world, and no doubt know it better than the actual people running the show. The world and lore is so expansive and unfortunately, the rights Amazon has are very limited. Rings of Power is technically an adaptation of the appendices, and the show is unable to use material not directly mentioned in them. So where the appendices does provide a lot to work with, the amount of material that Amazon can't use is equally large. Without the rights to the Silmarillion or any of Tolkien's extended works, the show is sometimes forced to write around certain things that they can't mention or to change things that suit their own purposes. This leaves events playing out differently than they did in the lore, often leaving the bitter taste of disappointment in the mouths of many, as events and characters that were highly anticipated are forced to be changed from how we've experienced them in Tolkien's writings. A prime example of this is Halbrand vs. Anatar as Sauron's alias. Because Anatar was never mentioned by name in the appendices, Rings of Power was unable to use the name or characterization. 
question. This is disappointing because it changes the story of how the rings are forged and the story leading up to it. It makes the show feel incongruent with the events of Tolkien's world and robs us of a true telling in a visual medium. Even with the things they have the rights to, they have made significant changes while adapting the material. For example, the timeline of Rings of Power is a mess, with the show effectively shuffling key moments from the appendices like they would a deck of cards. They are cherry picking what they find interesting as they are trying to balance the immortal characters with the mortal ones. Now on paper, adapting the most interesting aspects of the appendices isn't a bad thing, as at the end of the day, the purpose of the show is entertainment. Where the trouble arises is how changing the timeline would theoretically influence a change in character decisions moving forward. For example, in the lore, Celebrimbor and Sauron forge the 16 other rings before the elven rings. In the show, they forge the elven rings first. And after Galadriel and Elrond become aware that Halbron is actually Sauron, they tell Celebrimbor not to work with him again. So moving forward, in order to forge the rest of the rings, significant changes have to be made. There are a ton of changes like this that make the show feel slightly messy compared to the lore. The timeline of Rings of Power also feels condensed because they are cramming so many things into such a small time frame. In the timeline of the show, given the age of the mortal characters, it makes it feel like the last alliance will occur just after all the rings are forged. In the lore, the One Ring is forged during the 16th hundred year of the Second Age, and the last alliance didn't defeat Sauron until the 3441st year of the Second Age. Having these events occur so soon after each other in the show only serves to make Tolkien's world feel smaller and limits it from all that it could be. There were also changes that are done for seemingly no real reason other than the showrunners feeling that their version allows them to explore the things that they are more interested in. For example, in the show, Celeborn has mysteriously vanished, with Galadriel thinking that he is likely dead. This is a show invention and feels to me like it was done for two primary reasons. The first is to create a new mystery box which is something that the show seems to really like doing. There shouldn't be much of of a surprise though considering that one of the reasons showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay got the job was because J.J. Abrams vouched for them. The is that, that it represents infinite possibility. It represents hope. It represents potential. And I find myself drawn to infinite possibility and that sense of potential and I realize that mystery is the catalyst for imagination. The second reason I think they didn't include Celeborn was to milk some sexual tension out of the Galadriel Halbron relationship. These kinds of changes are disappointing because it feels melodramatic and I don't think it really serves the story or really adds anything to it. Probably one of the bigger issues I have with the adaptation changes is when they change the characterization of canon characters. By doing this, they are effectively creating their own characters wearing the skin of one of Tolkien's. The treatment of Gilgalad feels especially egregious as they make him come across as a manipulative, corrupt schemer instead of the noble character he is in the lore. I think a lot of these characterization changes are done to make for more intrigue and I feel like eventually the characters will lose loop back around to their canon portrayals, given where the story is supposed to go. But even if that's the case, I feel like for fans hoping for an accurate adaptation, these changes can be frustrating. Rings of Power also made the choice to create a number of show-only characters, and much of the focus of the season is on these characters. This makes for an incredibly difficult path to walk as the writers, as they have to try and create characters that are their own while still making them true to Tolkien. Original characters can potentially add a level of suspense and intrigue as book readers won't know where their stories are going. However, this can also make the show feel less like an adaptation and more like fan fiction as the events focus so much on characters that do not even exist in the original text. And this is where one of the greatest issues of Rings of Power reveals itself. The show is in the unenviable position of forcing the audience to ignore the connection to Tolkien lore in order to try and enjoy the show because it largely fails as an adaptation and the changes made can be very frustrating to watch. However, if the audience is forced to disassociate from the Lord of the Rings connection, then it beggars why continue watching at all as the only reason many people started to watch the show in the first place was because of said connection. This is a massive hurdle that the show needs to overcome, and likely one of the largest contributors to the vitriol directed at it. Um, we always wanted it to be practical and in-camera, and from our creature design, like our orcs, um, to our costumes, which are all handmade and um, laboriously aged to be dirty and old, <laughs> and, um, and our sets, which have layers and layers of storytelling and detail. We felt it was important that it that it be there, and uh, not just for our actors, but for the way it would look in the final in the final frame. Now, given the massive budget Amazon gave for the show, there is an expectation that the production side of things should be stellar. And I do think that since the budget was so big, people don't feel like succeeding in the technical aspect of the show is worthy of praise. I can understand where they are coming from with this, but I have to disagree on this point because, in my opinion, if something is good, it's good. The Jackson trilogy gave a framework for what Middle Earth should look like in a visual medium, and I think the Rings of Power did a good job in building upon that. New Zealand has become synonymous with live 
action Middle-earth, and I was happy to see that it plays host to the Rings of Power. The world feels visually consistent with what was presented in the trilogy, while still feeling distinct for the time that it takes place in. They even brought back John Howe, who worked on the Lord of the Rings trilogy as a concept artist. One of Rings of Power's greatest strengths is its ability to create beautifully cinematic moments. These moments often serve the story and are a visual treat for the eyes. Some frames from the show feel like beautiful paintings, created with love and incredible attention to detail. They also brought back Weta Workshop to help with the creation of props, sets, and practical effects. With the exception of the armor worn by Galadriel and her crew when being honored by Gilgalad, which looks like it's made of spray-painted styrofoam, the costuming and armor throughout the show looks really good. I especially like the armor Galadriel gets after her trip to Numenor, as well as Durin's dwarven prince getup. The orcs also look incredible, the practical effects bring them to life in a way that CGI never could. Another aspect that I think they do a good job with is the music laced throughout the show. Bear McCreary was tapped to do the music, and I think he does a really good job with it. The music enhances the scenes, and it is clear from watching interviews with McCreary that he was incredibly passionate about this job. He had big shoes to fill as Howard Shore's score for the Lord of the Rings trilogy is a timeless master piece, and although McCreary's work on Rings of Power does not match Shore's magnum opus, it still does a good job. I'm gonna have to write a piece of music that will be as famous as Howard Shore's Shire theme, <laughs> and will be scrutinized by a hundred million fans. Yeah. Having said that though, when I first heard the music for the title sequence, I thought it was a cut above the rest of the music in the show, and when I found out that it was actually Howard Shore who composed it, I understood why. One of the technical aspects that caught me off guard was the showrunner's decision to douse the show with a ton of slow-mo. They rely on slow-mo a lot in order to make the scene feel more epic than it actually is. For me, I think the overabundance of slow-mo actually detracts from the show and makes some of the scenes that could have been really cool feel kind of artificial. It can also be distracting at times, and I think it hinders more than it helps. I'm also convinced that if they were to take all of the scenes that were played in slow motion and instead played them at regular speed, you would lose a whole episode, because they really use slow-mo a lot. Although it's not really a technical aspect of the show in the same way the other things I discussed are, I felt now would be a good time to discuss some of the dialogue in the show. There are quite a few instances of stilted, overly stylized dialogue throughout the show, which feels like an attempt to evoke Tolkien in his writing. Their strokes fall like the stone giants of the North Wars. Most of the time, I don't feel like this works, as it does not end up feeling profound or clever in the way that I think they were going for, and instead just feels like a poor imitation of Tolkien's prose. It makes a lot of the characters speak in a very unnatural way, speaking in convoluted riddles instead of saying what they mean. So why don't you come out with that? Because a burden shared may either be halved or doubled depending on the heart that receives it. This can lead to some cringy moments and at times takes the audience out of the show. For the next sections of this review, I will be dissecting each of the four major storylines of Rings of Power. The main storylines are the Harfoot storyline, the Khazadum storyline, the Southland storyline, and the Numenor storyline. Each of these storylines effectively have their own main character, which are Nori, Elrond, Erondir, and Galadriel respectively. He goes up Nobody goes up Come on. Nobody wants to go. The Harfoot storyline shouldn't be in the show. It feels completely superfluous and doesn't really add anything. Nothing really happens in the Harfoot storyline, and considering how much screen time is dedicated to it, that is a major issue. My complaints about Rings of Power being boring largely rests upon the shoulders of the Harfoots, as they are uninteresting and whenever they are the focus, the pace of the show slows to a crawl. I feel like the Harfoot storyline was included for two main reasons. The first is because the showrunners felt like the show needed to have some hobbit-like creatures in order for the audience to feel like they are in Middle-earth. I don't think this is necessary, as they are not really relevant for the main story that the show is trying to tell. By shoehorning them into the show, they are distracting the audience from the stories that actually matter and have consequence. If they cut the Harfoots, we could have focused on more interesting characters who got short shrifted in the show, like Gilgalad and Celebrimbor. The second reason I think they included the Harfoots was as a means of introducing the Stranger as a Sauron alternative. The show uses him as a red herring to try and distract the audience from Halbrand, as there aren't really any other real possibilities of who Sauron could be. The depiction of the Harfoots is also something that I don't really think works. The Harfoots come across as cutthroat and are not so wholesome. When they travel from destination to destination, they seem more than willing to leave their own behind. When not Gandalf stumbles into their camp, they consider banishing the Brandyfoots before ultimately forcing them to the back of the line. They do this knowing that given Papa Brandyfoot's injured leg, they are almost guaranteed to fall behind and die. When not Gandalf helps carry the Brandyfoot's cart, Malva straight up says that they should break their cart and leave them for dead. Take their wheels and leave them. They talk a lot about the Harfoots being a family, a community that looks out for each other, but that is not what we are being shown, as none of the Harfoots are willing to help out the Brandyfoots. When Papa Brandyfoot gives his speech later on in the season, it rings hollow because they are not the good-natured, wholesome creatures that they claim to be. We stay true to each other. 
take their wheels and leave the so that was a fucking lie. This dissonance makes it difficult to take the Harfoots seriously. The Harfoots' journey also ends up feeling pointless. They spend most of the season walking to the Grove. They spend so much time walking that the clerk's description of the Lord of the Rings movies is actually an accurate description of the Harfoot storyline. And so it was that the group began to describe themselves walking. And as they described themselves walking, so did Obed confirm they walked. When they finally arrive at the Grove, it's been destroyed from the eruption of Mount Doom. So then, not Gandalf restores the Grove, only for it to be destroyed again in the very next scene. Then after all of this, at the end of the season, they just leave, migrating to some new location. Why can't not Gandalf just restore the Grove again? All of their carts are destroyed, so shouldn't they be trying to make new ones before they leave? It really feels like there was no reason for their journey at all. The most interesting thing about the Harfoot storyline is not Gandalf. The reason I am calling him not Gandalf is because the show simultaneously wants us to believe that this is not Gandalf. Gandalf, while at the same time practically screaming to the audience that it is Gandalf. Gandalf will make an appearance! Exclamation mark! Good theory! Great good, theory. Good, theory. Good, theory. Very good theory! Well, well done. done! In the last episode, they have the minions call him Sauron, try and trick the audience, but I didn't buy it for a second. Early in the season, they have him declare his name. I'm Perrin. And then, they have him claim an entirely different name. I'm Good. But no matter how many times they try to trick the audience, it is clear that he is supposed to be Gandalf. There are little callbacks throughout, like him whispering to the Fireflies similarly to how he whispers to the Moth in Fellowship. They also have him quoting Gandalf with the follow your nose line. If you doubt in the Anok, always follow your nose. When in doubt, Eleanor Brandyfoot. Always follow your nose. And at the risk of sounding inarticulate, he just has a Gandalf vibe. Something that I think is really stupid in the Harfoot storyline is Nori's crisis of faith near the end of the season. After fully believing in not Gandalf the entire time, she starts to get doubts after he has proved himself to the other Harfoots after defending them from a warg. She starts to think that he is dangerous because when he is healing himself, freezing his arm, she walks up to him and grabs his arm, which leads to the ice climbing up her hand. She walks away from this encounter questioning if not Gandalf actually is a good guy. This moment feels so stupid to me, it makes Nori look really dumb. When she walks in on him, it is clear that he is in some sort of trance, and she should have just let him be. Even though she doesn't know what he is doing, it is clear that he is incredibly powerful, and the smart thing to do would just be to leave him alone for a minute and reconvene later. I have no idea what Nori thought she was doing when she grabbed his ice arm after he had just failed to acknowledge her when she was trying to talk to him. It's clear that he was doing something, and she shouldn't have bothered him. This gets stupider when the tree branch falls when not Gandalf is healing the grove. Once again, they know that he is doing magic, and by now should know that they should give the man some space. When the little kids started walking closer to the wizard performing magic, they should have just stopped her and pulled her back before anything happened. Instead, after the tree branch falls, Nori acts like not Gandalf is some dangerous monster. This feels asinine considering all that not Gandalf has done for them. The main villains of the Harfoot storyline are the Mystics from Rune, or also known as Sauron's minions. The minions serve as some very unsatisfying villains, as they are only introduced in episode 5 and were not built up at all. They feel like a nothing burger, as they bring nothing interesting to the story. They also provide us with the worst fight sequence in the show. The fight between the Harfoots and the minions feels incredibly disjointed. In one scene, Sadik stabs a minion in the foot after she was trying to attack Nori and company. In the next scene, the Harfoots are suddenly in the trees throwing rocks at the minions. And then all of a sudden, they are on the ground, being cornered against a rock. It feels like throughout the whole fight, they are teleported from place to place, giving the entire scene a muddled feeling. I'm not saying they have to show each and every time the Harfoots move, but at the very least, let some time pass before they show up again in an entirely different location. The fight concludes with not Gandalf giving one of the cringiest lines ever. I'm good. It's one of those moments where showing is far better than telling, as not Gandalf was showing that he was good by defending the Harfoots from the minions, but by having him explicitly say it, the moment feels cringy and makes it seem like the showrunners don't trust the audience to understand what they are trying to convey. In the context of the show, this line does not work and it honestly feels like really poor writing. Hammering home just how much I don't care about the Harfoots is when Sadik is dying while watching the sunrise and all the Harfoots are sad. I feel nothing. Like, I don't care at all, which is a failure on the show's part for not making the audience care about the characters. The Harfoot storyline ends with Nori and not Gandalf heading east. And maybe it was just me, but I kind of got the impression that Nori didn't actually want to go with not Gandalf. It seemed like she was happy to stay with the Harfoots, and her parents were like, go on, get out of here. But yeah, overall I think the Harfoot storyline is the worst storyline of the show, and serves only to bore the viewer. It ruins the pacing of the show, and is time that would have been better spent elsewhere. So the fate of the entire elven race is in my hands. 
so it would appear. Moving on from the worst storyline in the show to what I consider to be the best storyline in the show, the Casa Doom storyline features the most compelling characters and tells its story in a way where the audience actually becomes invested with what is happening. It manages to capture some very Tolkienian themes, making it feel true to the source despite the changes that they made. Now coming into the show, the general audience starts already invested in Elrond and Galadriel from their roles in the Lord of the Rings movies. They allow the audience to cling on to a familiar face at the beginning of the story when they might not really know anyone else. This allows Elrond to start with the audience already in his corner. Now when we first meet Elrond, gives off a JV politician vibe as he is writing a speech for the High King. Later, when Gil-galad is giving the speech, Elrond is mouthing the words, clearly taking great pride in his work. I think this is a good reintroduction to the character and an interesting place to start off from. I will say though that it does bother me that Elrond, along with a number of other elves, notably Arondir and Celebrimbor, have short hair. It just feels wrong to me as I've come to associate elven beauty with their majestic long hair. It was initially very jarring and I feared the short haired elves might feel like pointy eared humans, but I think that they still felt like elves despite their chopped locks. As the season went on I got more and more used to the short hair, but it's still not a decision that I would have made. The crux of Elrond's story is the balancing act between friendship and duty. This is an intriguing premise, as throughout his story, Elrond is faced with dilemmas where he must prioritize one over the other. It's hard to see what is right when friendship and duty are mingled. As these two things are foundational pillars to who Elrond is and how he sees himself, putting him in difficult situations surrounding these things serves to create a compelling storyline and to explore who the character really is. The balancing act between friendship and duty begins with his interactions with Galadriel. Galadriel is certain that Sauron is still out there, in hiding, waiting until he has regained enough strength to attack. She pleads with Elrond and Gil-galad to grant her more troops to continue her search. However, Elrond sees Galadriel has started to lose herself and her ability to think properly has been and compromised. He cares for her deeply, but feels that she is a liability to the prosperity that they are trying to achieve. If you are wrong, I'm not if wrong. you are wrong, will you lead more elves to die in far off lands? He convinces her to board the ship to Valinor with the promise that if evil still exists, he will extinguish it. He feels guilty for the decision that he made, but in this instance, his duty went over his friendship. After Galadriel's departure, Gilgalad has a new mission for Elrond, as he has him assist Celebrimbor with his newest endeavor. It is later revealed that Gilgalad chose Elrond for this task so that he could get close to the dwarves and find the Mithril. However, it is unclear how he knew Elrond would go to the dwarves, and it seems like a bit of a leap on the writer's part. Also, speaking briefly on Celebrimbor's casting, I was a little disappointed by it. I think the actor does a good job with what he is given, but he has an older appearance which contrasts with the timelessness of the elves. Once again, this is just a minor superficial gripe, but where the elves are immortal, ageless beings, having the actor be on the older side is not the direction that I would have gone. Pretty quickly into his work with Kelly Brimbor, Elrond comes to the conclusion that the project would be helped by reaching out to the dwarves and his friend Prince Doran. However, he does not receive the welcome he expects from his old friend and is met at the entrance of Casa Doom with hostility. He must invoke an ancient dwarven rite to even get into the door. He enters a rock smashing contest with Durin, the consequences being that the loser is banished. This scene was honestly just kind of meh. However, once Elrond concedes, we are introduced to the Elrond-Durin relationship, which is the strongest relationship in the entire show. We learn that the reason Durin is so upset with Elrond is because he hasn't seen him in 20 years. 20 years may be the blink of an eye to an elf, but I've lived an entire life in that time. A life you missed. From Durin's perspective, he feels abandoned by his friend who missed out on his entire life and his accomplishments. This takes Elrond aback, because as an elf, to him it felt like no time has passed at all. It shows us how elves see the passage of time differently from other races, and how this can be an interesting effect on elvish relations with them. I think this is an interesting starting off point for their relationship in the show, and a great spot for them to start rebuilding where they left off. Durin accepts Elrond's apology and welcomes him back into his life, introducing him to his family. This is where we learn that the Rings of Power showrunners are cowards as they didn't have the balls to give us the bearded dwarf woman that we deserved. You're Elrond eventually finds out that the dwarves have discovered a new ore, Mithril. It's an incredibly rare resource, and Durin makes Elrond swear never to tell anybody about it. As a token of their friendship, he gives a piece of Mithril to Elrond. However, after playing host to Durin and Linden, Gilgalad lets Elrond know that the tree in Linden is rotting, and soon the elves will be unable to live in Middle-earth. Mithril is the key to saving the elves, and in order to obtain it, Elrond is put in a difficult position, once again forced to choose between friendship and duty. Now our people are doomed unless I break an oath. Betray a friend. 
In this instance, though, he chooses friendship, coming clean to Durin, telling him of all that he has learned, and placing the fate of his entire race in the hands of his friend. And his faith in his friend seems to be well placed, as Durin agrees to help him convince his father to give Mithril to the elves. Another important aspect of Elrond and Durin's bond is their relationships with their fathers, and how they relate to each other through this. Durin laments his father's controlling nature, and how he can be frustrating to deal with, while at the same time making note that the greatest thing a dwarf can do is to be worthy of his father's name. Elrond tries to comfort Durin by talking about his relationship with his own father, and how he has tried to live up to the great accomplishments of Arendil. He notes that where he used to fear whether or not his father would think of what he has done favorably, he now only wishes to speak with his father, no matter his judgment. I think this is a really good scene that continues to flesh out Elrond and Durin, while also further building their bond. After Durin's father doesn't bite on the pitch, the two are forced to consider how to move forward. There's also a quiet moment that I really liked where Durin wordlessly conveys to Elrond that they failed in convincing his father with nothing more than a look. In that look, Durin is able to convey his sadness and guilt. It is a rare moment in the show where the writers trust the audience to pick up on what is happening from the actor's performance. This also feels like a good time to highlight that I think Owen Arthur, Prince Durin's actor, is the absolute standard of the show. His performance as Durin is incredibly heartfelt and captivating, bringing another dimension to the character. After witnessing what Mithril can do to the decaying leaves, Durin decides to dig for Mithril without his father's blessing. Him and Elrond are caught by the king just as they uncover the massive deposits of Mithril. This leads to a confrontation between the Durins, where the king talks about how he knew his son was destined for greatness, and the prince talks about how he can't achieve greatness with his father constantly restricting him. The scene culminates when Durin names Elrond brother. Elrond is as much a brother to me as if he'd been fired in my own mother's womb. HOW DARE YOU! And King Durin is affronted by this, disowning him as his son and heir. This was a great scene and felt epic, especially considering it's just two actors going at it. At the end of the story, they introduce a Balrog at the bottom of the Mithril deposits, and I wasn't really a big fan of this decision. It came across as the writers trying to appeal to the audience to stick around for season 2, because it's going to get spooky down there in the mines, but for me, it felt like that didn't really need to be shown. When we do inevitably come across the Balrog in a future season, I feel like the moment might be robbed of some suspense and surprise, because they showed it in season 1 for no real reason. I will also talk about the Forging of the Rings from the perspective of Elrond, Celebrimbor, and Gilgalad in this section, and then talk about the Galadriel Hallbrand side of things later in the video. In regards to Celebrimbor, I feel like he is a wasted character. I feel like the smith who made the Rings of Power should have been much more of a focus in the show. He almost feels like a non-character and more like a plot device to make the rings. I feel like he should have been interacting far longer with the Anatar Hallbrand figure and really built up that relationship. I feel like that relationship would have been incredibly interesting to explore, as well as Celebrimbor's desire to forge the rings and his ambition to make something truly great. Also, if Celebrimbor and Halbrand spent more time together and were real partners in the forging, the reveal that he was Sauron all along would have been more impactful, with Celebrimbor trying to come to grips with how he was used and how that potentially sullies his work. I think Sauron's betrayal to Celebrimbor would have been more impactful than the betrayal of Halbrand to Galadriel, because in the case of Celebrimbor it colors his view of his greatest work, whereas with Galadriel they were just kind of crushing on each other and were war buddies. This could also be what leads to Celebrimbor wanting to make the three elven rings after the fact as a means of redemption and to free himself from the work that he did with Sauron. What we got in the show was Celebrimbor meeting Halbrand in the final episode out, and then Hallbrand essentially telling him what to do, with Celebrimbor seeming like he would not have been able to come close to forging the rings without Sauron's guidance. It makes Celebrimbor a really disappointing character, and I can't help but wish more time was devoted to him and his story. Elrond's story comes full circle with the return of Galadriel in the final episode. In the first episode he chose duty, and after his experiences with Durin throughout the season, he tells Galadriel that he regrets that decision, and moving forward he will not make that kind of choice again. I think this is a good arc for Elrond in the first season. Overall, I think the khazad Doom storyline is the best, most consistent storyline in the Rings of Power. However, that is not to say that it is not flawed. Also, while I think it is a well-told story and actually got me invested in some of the characters, I can't help but feel that given the source material, it could have been way better. Even when it is at its best, Rings of Power has me asking what if, and wishing for a different universe where the show lives up to its true potential. Only twice in known history has a pairing between elves and humans even been attempted, and on each occasion, it ended in tragedy. It ended in death. You need not remind me. 
The Southland storyline is a very mixed bag as it has some of the best sequences in the show as well as some of the absolute most egregious sequences. It also really suffers from not having any really interesting fully formed characters to root for. It might just be me, but I found that sometimes there would be a really cool moment that would have been suspenseful if I actually cared about the characters that are in danger. It is also marred by attempting the human elf love story, but lacking any of the chemistry or tragedy that makes these relationships so juicy. The Southlands plot starts out with some elves wearing armor with weirwood trees on them from Game of Thrones, patrolling a small town that once fought alongside Morgoth. The opening scene does a good job of showing the hostility between the people and their elvish watchmen. Oh, let it go, knife is. But y'all don't say that. We key in on one elf in particular. Erondir, who serves as the main character for this storyline. And I gotta say, he really does nothing for me as a character. He comes across as incredibly bland, lacking any personality. It doesn't help that his delivery is pretty wooden. The people of Holden were known for having been especially strong in the loyalty to Morgoth. And I think this is done intentionally to try and make him some strong silent type with a certain dignified nobility about him. But it comes across like he is disinterested in everything going on. It's hard to get invested in him because there is not much to be said about him other than that he is noble and is in love with a human. Speaking of said romance, his human counterpart doesn't offer much more than Arondir does. Admittedly, she does seem to have more personality than Arondir, but that's not very hard to do. She is a healer and has a bit of fire in her, taking charge when the Southlands start going to shit. She is also mother to Theo, a relationship that I am told is important to both of them, but I am not really sure I believe it, at least from her end. If anything, it seems like she forgets that she has a son most of the time. And where Rondir and Bronwyn are bland apart, they do not suddenly become interesting when they are together. When the show starts, it is clear that they have been making goo goo eyes at each other for some time, and supposedly have reasons to like each other. Unfortunately, we don't really learn what those reasons are. It almost feels like the only thing they have in common is not hating each other's kind, which is rather prevalent in their town. Arondir is only one of the elves patrolling the Southlands. Others, such as Revion and Medhor, characters whose names I would have never remembered without Amazon's nifty info guide, patrol alongside him. Revion seems to be the leader of the outpost, and he tells Arondir that the people of the Southlands are still baddies. The way this is framed, the show wants us to think that Revion is wrong, but he ends up being half right considering half of them end up joining Adar of their own volition. Regardless, the elves have decided that they are bored of watching the Southlanders with their elf eyes, and are getting ready to depart. Arondir is not big on the idea, and so he visits Bronwyn before he is set to leave. While there, they discover a cow that has chocolate milk, and they decide to investigate. They come across a series of tunnels, where Arondir crawls in a muddy hole for a while, and Bronwyn goes back to warn the village. No one believes Bronwyn, and then she goes home where we are treated to the first absolutely terrible scene of this storyline. When she gets home, she finds a hole in their floor, and Theo hiding in a cubby in the wall. Theo pops his head out and says that there is an orc, and for her to go get help. He then snuggles back into his little hidey hole. I feel like there was some miscommunication when directing the scene, because with the amount of time they they are talking before they even hear a noise, it is clear that they both had enough time to run out the front door and go get help. Theo has no reason to start hiding again because there's nothing dangerous around and he could just leave. It gets stupider when Bronwyn decides not to leave and get help and instead hides in a cabinet. Like why? The front door is right there, there's nothing stopping them from leaving. After what feels like forever, we finally hear and see an orc start to emerge from the hole in the ground. They try to have this long and drawn out sequence of maybe the orc will hear them, maybe it won't. Oh my god, this is so terrifying, can't you see how scared they are? But it really doesn't feel suspenseful at all because the whole time I'm just thinking about how stupid they are for not running away. I don't care if they die because based on the decision made, I am honestly kind of hoping for it. When they hide instead of run, it feels contrived and like the only reason they stay is because there is a big set piece coming. Meanwhile, back with the Rondir in the prison camps, we find out that all the other elves have been captured too. The orcs are digging this massive tunnel system for some reason and using the elves as their workforce. Smack dab in the middle of the tunnel's path is a tree which the orcs want chopped down. The elves refuse and are rewarded with a sip of water and a sliced throat for the elf whose name I've already forgotten. This this leaves Arondir to step up and cut down the tree. Now this is actually a kind of interesting moment for Arondir, as he shows himself willing to compromise his beliefs when he is pushed to his limit and if it means potentially saving others. This is actually an intriguing character beat, and although nothing else really comes of it this season, it might be something to watch out for in later seasons. Not long after this, the elves stage an escape plan. They attack in the middle of the day and use their chains as whips, and it actually looks pretty cool. I also like the rhythmic way they are hammering at their chains to try and escape, almost like everything they do is graceful 
tasteful or musical in some way. However, this is where my praise ends for this scene. As the scene goes on, it becomes clear that the only elf here that knows how to Legolas is a Rondir. The rest of the sequence is a Rondir absolutely doing everything to ensure that an elf escapes, and all of his teammates bottling it. He breaks the tent, forcing the orcs further back. He distracts the warg and then later kills it, saving Revion's life in the process. He is literally carrying the entire team on his back. This scene feels like when you are playing a video game and your allies are computers. They are there and technically helping you, but the reality is that you are doing all of the work and are having to constantly save your allies from dying with their crappy AI. In this scene, Aaron Deer is the player character and all of the other elves are his NPC allies. It makes it feel like everyone except for Aaron Deer is completely incompetent and doesn't matter. There is a moment where, after freeing himself, Revion throws away his axe, his only weapon. Why does he do this? The only explanation is bad AI programming because he needs it literally two seconds later when he is face to face with the warg. This forces Aaron Deer to throw his spear and save him once again. This scene tells us that the only character here that matters, that is important, is a Rondir, and the rest are just there to make him look cool. After a Rondir serves escape to Revion on a silver platter, he is killed by arrows anyway, although I did appreciate the archer who shot him doing a little selly in the background. This scene is made worse by the fact that none of it matters anyway, because the orcs let a Rondir go in the next scene to deliver a message. So the elves' whole idea of getting one of them to escape so that they could get reinforcements could have been done without all of them dying. If even one of us makes it home, we can return in force and sweep the enemy from these lands like salt from a table. I mean, Arondir doesn't go get reinforcements like his comrades died for, but they came anyway, so that's lucky. The person who releases Arondir is known as Adar, and is probably the coolest character in the Southlands. He was once an elf that was captured by Morgoth and tortured, twisting him until he became one of his minions. In an interesting twist of fate, he comes to love the orcs and view them as his children. His actions throughout the show are a means of making a home for his children, where they can be free to live in darkness. This is a fascinating backstory for a character, and he is without a doubt the most interesting character in the Southlands plotline. He is also played by the same actor who played Benjamin Stark in Game of Thrones, so that's pretty neat. While this is going on, the Southlanders have fled to the abandoned elf guard tower. Bronwyn tries to take charge and they find themselves lacking food. Theo decides to take matters into his own hands and raid the abandoned village for whatever he can carry. Unfortunately, it's not as abandoned as he thinks it is, and he is forced to hide in a well. After hiding for a while, Theo decides it's time to go home and sets out on his way back to the tower. What follows is a one-take tracking shot that follows Theo as he engages stealth mode and tries to escape from the orcs unnoticed. It's a pretty cool sequence. I also have to applaud Theo's dedication to getting the food, as he goes back for his abandoned bag of grain instead of just booking it out of there. He almost escapes, but he is tackled right when he thought he was home free, only for a Rondir to come to his rescue. This is also around the same time that Bronwyn remembers she has a son, and the two help Theo escape. When they get back to the tower, a Rondir gives the message that the orcs are coming, leading half of the Southlanders to leave and swear allegiance to Sauron in hopes that they will be protected. This seems like a good time to touch on Theo, as there was definitely a non-zero chance that he would leave considering his affinity for the Sauron blade key that he uses to stab his arm with. I'm not necessarily invested in him at this point, but I do feel like he is a character with a ton of potential in the future. He has flirted with darkness, but ultimately stayed on the side of light, largely because of his mother. Now previously I mentioned that Bronwyn doesn't seem like she remembers that she has a kid half of the time, but from Theo's end of things, he seems to desperately care for his mother. Now this probably just comes down to the performance from the actor, but this kid desperately loves his mom. I think the only reason he stayed when the Southlanders left is because his mom stayed. He also later gives Adar the key to save his mom, showing a willingness to sacrifice things for the ones he loves. I think it would be interesting to see Theo's trajectory in later seasons after his mom dies. There are a lot of theories about him becoming a Nazgul, and I think that's at least interesting as an idea. The point is, I think that his character has potential, and is one of the show only characters that should be watched closely going forward. After the Southies leave, we learn that Arondir is a glass half full kind of guy, as he chooses to focus on the half of the Southies that stayed. While trying to get Theo comfortable with having an elf as his new stepdad, he finds out about the key. He tells this to Bronwyn who immediately loses hope and wants to give up because the tower will fall. And when they march upon us, this tower will fall. Say that again? This tower will fall. Guys, I got it. They decide to drop the tower on the orcs when they come a knocking. Honestly, I kind of like the tower fall plan. It's a fun little set piece, even if they get kind of lucky with the way everything plays out and how the tower falls. With the orcs preoccupied, it gives the Southlanders the perfect time to full on run away. And when they don't, it beggars the question, 
Why not? Why do they stay and fight when defeat seems inevitable? I guess the reasoning would be that these are their homes and they don't want to abandon them, but at the same time, they never really seem to be especially fond of the Southlands before this. It would make sense for them to just leave now and settle in a new place where they aren't going to be killed by orcs. This isn't a huge sticking point for me, but it seems a little odd that it's not even brought up as an option. They make preparations to stand and fight. With the lead up to the battle, a Rondir tries to hide the key, but unfortunately he's not very good at hiding. Even if Theo didn't watch where he hid it, the orcs would have no doubt eventually found it considering it was just under one of the floorboards. What he should have done is just sent someone away with it, telling them to ride until they came across a large body of water and then yeeted it in there. The worst thing to do is to leave it where they are. We then get to the big battle of the Southland story. It's actually a pretty entertaining fight all things considered. I like the cool little fire trap they set and I actually find it really funny when Bronwyn couldn't start the fire to light the hay bales. Alright, stop right where you're at. We're gonna go to matches. There was one little wonky moment where some orcs were suddenly on a roof in order to get Arondir on the ground. It was also a really fun moment when Arondir fought the big orc and he found himself drinking a leader of the orcs spouting eye blood. <laughs> The reveal that they had just fought their own was also an interesting development, but not quite the mind-bending revelation it was made out to be. Also, I loved how there was an orc who wasn't quite dead yet so that he could talk shit before he died. Classic. Had to pay the toll. And now, all of you will... All in all, it was a pretty entertaining battle sequence, and my only major gripe is that I didn't really care about what happened to the characters, so there wasn't really much stakes to it. After surviving the initial wave, the Southlanders are quickly defeated, and Adar enters the building. He starts killing people, hoping a Rondir gives him the key in order to make him stop. Ultimately, it's Theo that gives up the info, when his mom's life is threatened. When Adar took the wrapped package, my first thought was that if he doesn't unwrap this, and it turns out to not be the key, that will be really stupid. And when he opened it to make sure, I was pleasantly surprised. Good job, Rings of Power. You didn't do something dumb. Unfortunately, this is short-lived, as once Galadriel gets the key back, she doesn't check it to make sure it's what they were after. Later, when she hands it to Arondir, he doesn't check either. Finally, Theo checks, but after he finds out that it doesn't contain the key, he doesn't say anything. It would have been futile by that point anyway, but at least have him realize what's happened and start panicking or something. After the explosion of Mount Doom and the Numenorians and Southlanders have fled, Adar and his children emerge into the realm of darkness. When Adar says that this land is no longer the Southlands, a title card appears on the screen reading Southlands and then evaporates into the word Mordor. Now, this has been heralded as one of the absolute worst moments in the show and has been used to illustrate just how bad the show is. In my opinion, this is a little overblown. Now don't get me wrong, I think the title transition is completely unnecessary and shows that the writers have a lack of trust in their audience to understand what is happening without explicitly telling them. However, it's not actually something that is super detrimental to the show or makes it much worse. It feels like a moment that is easy to meme rather than an example of terrible writing. I think the I'm good moment is comparable as both instances are the show telling rather than showing, but in the case of the I'm good, it's much more in your face as it is being used as an epic one-liner before not Gandalf kills the minions. Overall, the Southland storyline has some good set pieces and some bad set pieces. Its biggest failure is being unable to create fleshed out characters who the audience can invest in. And there, in the darkness, his vow became mine. This is the storyline that has drawn the most attention from the viewing audience and is arguably the main plot of the season. And if this can be considered the main storyline, Galadriel can be seen as the main protagonist. Coincidentally, this is also where a lot of people have issues with the show as the fan base has grown to revile this interpretation of the Galadriel character. Some of the criticisms levied against her are completely valid while others I feel like some members of the audience are intentionally ignoring aspects of her characterization. Similar to how I mentioned that the audience was pre-invested in Elrond because of his appearance in The Lord of the Rings, the same thing can be said of Galadriel. Coming into this season I think a lot of people wanted to like this character. I also think making her the face of the show was a good decision, as Galadriel is one of the most historyed characters in all of Middle Earth, and she had all of the makings of an incredible character. Unfortunately, when they came to actually writing for her and adapting her to the screen, they left a lot to be desired. The simple fact of Galadriel's portrayal in the Rings of Power is that she is unlikable. Once to your character, will people love her or love to hate her? I think that, um, I hope that people feel empathy for her. She is characterized as being extremely reckless, blunt, demanding, and aggressive. She is a bull in a china shop, lacking any tact when it comes to communicating with others. I demand to speak with the king directly. 
that I might present my proposal to one who holds the authority to answer it. Lady. It is because of the elves that you were given this island. A pattern that emerges throughout her story is that Galadriel arrives at a place, talks about her duty and the evil in the world, and then demands that the person she is talking to give her an army. She remains obstinate despite everyone she interacts with telling her to calm down and to think through the things she does before she acts. Her way of communicating makes her come across as aggressive, arrogant, and unfortunately, unlikable. This creates a massive hurdle for the show as the main protagonist spends a lot of her screen time alienating her built-in fanbase. As the show goes on, the audience is less and less on her side, as she is seen as impetuous and entitled. I think it is clear that the showrunners were looking to start Galadriel at her low point, and over the course of the series, are hoping to have the character grow and acquire wisdom through her years of hardship. In the films and in the books, you know, fans have encountered her as the wise ethereal lady of the woods who's offering pearls of wisdom and gentle guidance. And in our show, she's sort of, you know, the driving obsessed, you know, uh, a warrior in a way. She's younger. Um, she's not quite formed yet. She's raw. She's making mistakes. I think they also attempt to get the audience on her side by introducing her first through her loss of her brother Finrod and how her grief has led her down this dark and dangerous path. Unfortunately, the show doesn't do quite enough to fully tell that story, and Galadriel comes across as a 2000 year old child having a temper tantrum. Now having said all that, I don't think Galadriel is a lost cause, and the last thing she is is uninteresting. This brings me to the criticism of Galadriel that I think is less fair, and comes from a place of not paying attention or purposefully ignoring what the show is trying to tell the audience. There has been a lot of talk about Galadriel as an infallible Mary Sue who is a strong woman and always right and all of the men around here are stupid and wrong and hating on her because she is too perfect. What devilry is this? I do not think Galadriel is a Mary Sue, nor do I think the show is trying to portray her like one. When making this argument, people point to two major things. The fact that she is hyper competent and the fact that she is correct in her thinking that Sauron is still at large. As far as the hyper competence goes, I don't equate being a skilled fighter with being a perfect character. It makes sense that after thousands of years of fighting, she would gain an incredible level of skill. I would have an issue if the first time she picked up a sword, she was amazing with it. Similar to how in The Force Awakens, Rey is able to use Jedi mind tricks a couple hours after learning what the Force is, and then best Kylo Ren in a lightsaber battle after he has practiced his entire life and she just picked up a lightsaber for the first time. The point is that Galadriel being a good fighter is earned and justified with the backstory they have given her. In the same vein, people make the argument that her being better than all of her troops is a way of Amazon forcing their agenda of strong women. And my thoughts on this are similar to my thoughts on Arondir and his prisoner escape. It's not about showing that she is better than all of the men around her, and is more the show treating all of the red shirts as poorly programmed allied AI in a video game. In the eyes of the show, the elves on her expedition with her don't matter, because by the end of the episode, they are off to Valinor, never to be seen again. So the showrunners use this time to try and show Galadriel's capabilities and introduce her as a strong fighter. As I said in the Arondir section, I think this is a flaw of the show, but is not some secret conspiracy to turn the frogs gay. To the second point about how Galadriel is right about Sauron wherever everyone else around her is wrong, I really feel like this one carries even less weight. Because yes, Galadriel is right that Sauron is still at large. However, she is wrong about nearly everything else and her reckless actions unwittingly reinvigorate Sauron. It really feels like the people who say Galadriel is always right have cherry picked moments in order to feed their own narrative about the show. The whole point about Galadriel's arc is that she is wrong in her undying pursuit of Sauron. We foresaw that if it had she might have inadvertently kept alive the very evil she sought to defeat. It's not even a case of the show trying to frame her actions as just and righteous, because there are moments when the character self-reflects about how she has consistently messed up. She admits that the reason her troops mutinied against her and her close friend tricked her into an early retirement is because her judgement had become so clouded that she could no longer be trusted. The company I led mutinied against me. My closest friend conspired with the king to exile me. And each of them acted as they did. Because I believe they could no longer distinguish me from the evil I was fighting. In the first few scenes when she is leading her expedition north, we are not supposed to be thinking, wow, Galadriel's so right. These other elves are jamokes. We are supposed to be thinking that Galadriel's trauma has led her too close to the darkness and that she is actively wrong to be so resistant to listening to Thondir. Also, after she had led the Numenorean army to their deaths, in the aftermath she once again acknowledges that she shouldn't have been so desperate in getting them to fight for her and that their deaths are her responsibility. What are you so bothered about? It isn't your fault. Yes, it is. 
And the biggest thing she is wrong about is Halbrand and how she essentially motivates Sauron to come out of hiding and try to rule Middle Earth. This is the biggest fuck up in the entire show and Galadriel and her warmongering ways are to blame. To say that she is a Mary Sue after this seems ignorant to me because to me, being a Mary Sue is not about being hyper competent, it is about the decisions that the characters make and how that impacts the world. By Galadriel unwittingly propping up Sauron, that is the show emphatically saying that Galadriel and her warmongering ways are wrong. I also think her obsession with trying to find Sauron is meant to be coming from a place of trauma and guilt. She is acting this way because she has survivor's guilt and PTSD from her years of fighting. She doesn't want to go to Valinor because she doesn't think she deserves it. In her mind, she deserves to suffer. Her journey is about trying to let go of that pain and to try to grow from it, to be better than she was. Now you might say that this is a stretch, and I am inferring things that the writers never intended. And while I admit that is possible, I believe that the story is there. The show just doesn't do a good job telling it. Galadriel is the eye of the storm when it comes to the hate directed towards Rings of Power, and I find that incredibly interesting. I'm honestly really curious about what others think about her and her portrayal in the show, so I would be really interested to hear what you guys have to say about her in the comments. Now that I have addressed the Oliphant in the room, we can get back to the actual moments that comprise Galadriel and Numenor's story. The show opens with young Galadriel being told something by her brother Finrod, and admittedly this is a very stupid metaphor about why a stone sinks and a boat floats. It's one of those moments I mentioned earlier about the show being a poor imitation of Tolkien and trying to sound profound. Similar to the text shift, this seems to be one of the moments that people have latched onto as to why the show is so awful, and my thoughts are kind of similar to the text shift. It is poorly written dialogue and definitely a blemish, but I think it is overblown. The memes about it are fun though. Also, they try to connect the ending of it to the final episode when Galadriel sees herself in the reflection as the Queen of Darkness. I actually kind of like this callback, and if the start of the metaphor wasn't so poorly written, this moment would work even even better. We also get opening narration from Galadriel, similar to how Cape Blanchette's Galadriel narrated the opening of Fellowship. I've seen people criticizing this as a member berries moment, but I actually liked it. With a lot of the member berries criticism, it just feels like people don't like callbacks and are giving the showrunners the nefarious motivation of manipulating the audience into liking a bad show. I honestly don't think it goes that deep, and I like the decision to have Galadriel narrate the opening, and I think her actress, Morfid Clark, does a good job of it. Where there could potentially be some criticism is the contents covered in the narration, and how it makes some pretty big leaps. At the end of the first episode, we get what is in my opinion the first completely awful, stupid, terrible, no good moment in the show. And that is when Galadriel jumps off the boat in the middle of the sea. This decision should kill Galadriel. Effectively stranded at sea in the middle of nowhere with no one around, she should be dead from this. The only reason she doesn't die is because she is the main character and has to live. Decisions like this take me out of the story as it feels like some characters are exempt from the consequences of their actions. She is forced to swim and swim until she comes across a raft because of course she does. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. On the raft she meets a bunch of randos that die like two seconds later and a man named Halbrand whose first words on the show are Looks can be deceiving. Apparently a lot of people clocked him for Sauron immediately after this line, but it took me a little longer than that. The sequence on the raft is not something that I really get, and I feel like that could be a product of bad writing. When the sea monster comes to eat the raft, we see Halbrand break off his own little mini raft and leave the rest of his buddies for dead. This served as some immediate characterization, showing us that Halbrand only looks out for himself and doesn't care about saving others. He's not a hero. Up to this point, this feels like some good writing, introducing a new character and showing us who he is by the decisions that he makes. Unfortunately, they almost immediately undo this good work and give the audience whiplash as he does the exact opposite right after. When Galadriel gets caught on a rope and dragged into the water, why does Halbrand risk his own life to save her? It feels like it contradicts what they just told us about him. I feel like this makes even less sense when we learn that his true identity is Sauron. I think the show wants us to feel this almost instant bond between the two and how this meeting was faded, but I didn't really get that and as a result I don't really care for this moment. Also, this is just a little thing, but after Elendil saves them and brings them onto the ship, they waste time dancing around the fact that they're sailing to Numenor. To what port do we sail? See for yourself. We're nearly there. Nearly where? Home. Not a huge deal, but it just kind of annoyed me, like, just say the name. When we finally arrive at Numenor, we are treated to some of the goofiest moments in the entire show, and some more scenes of Galadriel yelling at people to give her an army. This results in her being watched and arrested. In both instances, this doesn't really seem to matter, as it seems like she can escape whenever she wants. In particular, I think Galadriel's escape from herself feels especially silly and provides some unintentional comedy. It also has the side effect of making it so that I take everything less seriously. 
as moments like these hamper my investment in the show. This silliness continues during our time in Numenor after the region has agreed to send an army to Middle Earth. During a training session, Gladriel gives some words of advice to the Numenorean soldiers. But for you, I will keep it strong and simple. Stab, twist, gut. Thanks, Captain Obvious. You mean, if I want to kill an orc, I should stab it with my sword? Wow. Once again, just a silly moment that really didn't need to be said. This then leads us to the one verse a bunch of people practice session that was giving off a little bit of Pirates of the Caribbean vibes to me. Whoever is able to draw blood from Galadriel gets a promotion, but god damn they were really striking to kill. Like, if any of these actually connected, Galadriel would be dead. The scene ends with Halbrand needlessly doing a sword trick for no real reason other than he is a show off. Speaking of Sauron, I mean Halbrand? He's been having his own little goofy adventure on the sidewall in Numenor. He finds that he likes it there and wants to get a job as a smith. Only problem is, he doesn't have a guild crest, so he decides that the best way to get one is to steal it off a smith. He's caught pretty instantly, but even if he wasn't, there's no way that this works. If he shows back up to the forge, first thing they're going to ask is how he got the crest, because I assume you can't get one in a day. It should be pretty obvious that he hasn't done his blacksmith test. It turns out that Halbrand has a little trinket with the sigil of the King of the Southlands. Galadriel focuses in on this and declares him to be the missing heir. Pretty big leap in logic as he could just be some guy who found it. Something Halbrand even says. But Galadriel doesn't want to listen, nor is she interested in doing any research at the moment to make sure that she is not basing her entire war plans on an assumption. During our time in Numenor, we meet a bunch of new characters, but at the moment I only really care to talk about two, Elendil and Isildur. Two incredibly important and interesting characters in Tolkien lore, I was really excited to see them in the show. They had a few moments throughout season one, but they will be a much more prominent in future seasons. I think Elendil's actor, Lloyd Owen, is another standout in the cast, bringing the necessary gravitas to the character. I was also very interested in Isildur's portrayal in Rings of Power, because as he is most famous for not destroying the ring, many people see him as a corrupt character. With Rings of Power taking a deeper look into him, I was hopeful that we would get a glimpse of the incredibly complex character that he is. So are you ready to go on the Isildur rehabilitation tour? I feel very mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and honored to, to play this character who is a complex one mm. as well because he does something that kind of a lot of people are, are confused about because he had the opportunity to defeat evil. But at the same time, you know, we are all human. We all have the capacity for good and evil in us. This season didn't do all that much with him, but they show him to be an eager young man in search of purpose and duty. He doesn't want to join the Sea Guard and intentionally fails, hoping it would allow him to travel west to where his brother, Anarion, is. Unfortunately, his stunt not only gets him fired, but also his two best buds. Isildur's motivations then change and I kind of wish we had more time with him to really flesh them out. He decides his failure is a disgrace and he doesn't deserve to go west, but when Numenor decides to send ships to Middle-earth, he is one of the very first to volunteer. Is this an attempt to get his honor back? Why is he not worthy to go west, but is worthy to go to Middle-earth? I'm not saying his decision making is bad, just that I wish it was explored more. I think when there is a moment to do something for Numenor and his friends are going, he he has to be on that ship. Yeah. And it's also a sense of adventure and a sense of escape that I think Sealer wouldn't have batted an eyelid. I don't think he, West was even an option at that point. Mm. Probably my favorite part about Isildur in season one is his relationship with his one true love, Beric the Horse. There you are. Beric, my boy. Take care of Beric for you, I promise. Beric's coming? I'm sorry, you see him. It's not his pain that's bothering him. That of his rider. Easy boy. <laughs> he forms an unbreakable bond with the soldier he bears. In time, they become as one. The Numenorean campaign ends up feeling somewhat half-baked as once they land, they charge their horses into a full-on sprint when they don't actually know where the battle is. They only suspect that there is still fighting going on in the region. They
they don't know for sure that there is a battle actively taking place, or if there is one, where it is. Arondir and his crew didn't send word for help, so why are they marching so urgently? It just seems weirdly framed to me and would be a good way to tire out the horses long before the battle starts. When they actually arrive, the battle is pretty cool. Unlike the Southlands cast of characters, I'm actually invested in the Numenorean cast. Now, most of the ones I'm invested in are characters I know from the books, but I find myself kind of liking Isildur's buddies and was interested in what would happen to them. I also liked seeing Galadriel riding in with her battle braid and pulling out some pretty cool horse moves. We also get a really cool chase sequence between her and Adar. I do have one gripe about the chase sequence though, and that is the fact that Halbrand starts behind Galadriel, and then all of a sudden he is riding from the opposite direction heading straight for Adar. Did he teleport? The framing of him coming out of nowhere kind of dampens the fun I was having on the chase sequence just moments before. This is also a good time to bring up the Sauron-Adar dynamic as the show makes it clear that there is a history between these two characters. There is a lot of hatred and mixed feelings there between them. Adar tells Galadriel about how he killed Sauron up north and he also doesn't recognize Halbrand. Obviously, it seems to me that Sauron changes his appearance and that is why Adar doesn't recognize him. This built up backstory between the two makes me more interested in what exactly happened and how the two will interact once Sauron strolls back into Mordor. I think this is also a good moment to bring up the fact that in the show, Sauron is very disconnected from the orcs and the creation of Mordor. It seems like he doesn't really like the orcs, citing earlier that they chased him out of his Home. From where I see it, it wasn't elves that chased me from my homeland. It was orcs. He also makes claims that he will not abandon the Southlands to darkness, but how is that going to work? Sauron is supposed to be supremely evil, so it just feels weird that they are disconnecting him from all of the things that he is associated with. After not checking to make sure that they actually got the key back, Mount Doom erupts and we are treated to what is in my opinion a visually stunning scene. Now, this scene also led to the volcano experts coming out of the woodwork to say what does and doesn't work about this scene. A lot of people were angry that the volcano smoke or pyroclastic flow didn't kill everyone or Pompeii them, and while I can definitely understand this, it wasn't really an issue for me personally. When it comes to Mount Doom explosions, my suspension of disbelief is pretty high, considering that Frodo and Sam were still inside when it exploded in The Lord of the Rings. I think it's justified to be upset at this scene considering the show had the smoke sweep directly over everyone for the purposes of a cool shot, but it doesn't bother me personally. What I do find kind of silly though is after Galadriel gets up, her and Theo are unable to find anyone else when they are like literally right next to them. This little pairing of Theo and Galadriel does let us get the first mention of Celeborn, and I'm happy that the writers at least acknowledge his existence even though they are changing his story. After Muriel vows to return, Galadriel and Halbran head to Eregion for some elven healing, and here she suddenly gets really suspicious of Halbran. Was she picking up on all the clues along the way, or did she have no idea until she saw someone post the theory online? To her credit though, the showrunners throw all subtlety out the window this episode to the point that Halbrand almost feels like a completely different character. Every scene he is in this episode feels like he's a giant flashing red eye. It also wasn't really a surprise for most people, as it seems that people had caught on to his true identity pretty early on. It does kind of rob the moment of its dramatic tension because it almost feels like the audience is just waiting for him to reveal himself and get it over with. I do think though that after he does reveal himself, we get a couple of compelling scenes with him and Galadriel as he takes her through his mindscape. The showrunners have stated that their desire to build a relationship between Sauron and Galadriel came from reading one of Tolkien's poems about Galadriel. On paper, I think having some history between the big bad and your protagonist can often enhance the conflict between them and make things far more personal, adding to the drama. I don't think having the two characters interact was by any means a bad decision. I just think they spent too much time together and I think it would have been a better choice if the relationship between Sauron and Celebrimbor was more focused on as I proposed earlier in the video. That seems to be the way of Rings of Power though, as they choose to write storylines that are fine, ignoring better alternatives and forcing the show to live in the shadows of stories untold. As the season comes to a close, we can see Galadriel coming to an end of her first arc, as she finally is ready to let go of her brother's dagger that she has been clinging so tightly to. This decision, as well as the revelation that she unwittingly helped Sauron, show that she is willing to start to change her viewpoint and not to be constantly on the warpath. We hope people take away a little Tolkien, you know, uh, uh, his stories are filled with darkness and intensity and the sort of darker side of human nature and non-human nature, um, but at the end of the day they're optimistic and hopeful and we hope people get a little piece of that. It would be wonderful if, if even in some small way it translates to the screen. The first season of Rings of Power was a bit of a mess. It has a ton of flaws and feels bloated in some ways, focusing on stories that really have no reason to be told and underserved other stories, spreading itself too thin to really flesh out all of its characters and do them justice. 
It owes all of its success to its connection to the source material, but that is also why it has become so hated. If this wasn't an adaptation of Tolkien's world, it would be a boring, mediocre fantasy show trying to capitalize on a fad. Not something truly terrible, but not something particularly good either. I'm not huge on giving out number scores, but if I had to rate Rings of Power for what it is, I would probably give it a 4 out of 10, as the feeling I was left with was mostly meh. However, it is supposed to be an adaptation of Tolkien's world and his characters, and in this regard, it fails. For what it is, it's a 4 out of 10. But for what it could have been, it's probably a 2 out of 10. That's why I think so many people have such hatred for the show. Why they blow every little mistake into these massive sticking points, it's because they feel robbed of the story that could have been told, and they feel the need to vent and get everything off of their chest. The Rings of Power isn't going anywhere, and I know that moving forward I will watch the new seasons that come out. I even have hope that the showrunners will learn from their mistakes, and we might be treated to a good story, even if it's not the one that we hoped for or expected. If you somehow made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you for watching. I'm sure you all have just as many thoughts on Rings of Power as I do, so feel free to let me know what you think of the show in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, it would mean a lot if you liked and subscribed. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.